Let's open our Bibles back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is Jesus Christ's message on the end of the world. And it is so comprehensive, he draws from nearly every portion, both Old and New Testament uh, revelation. A lot of it is amplified by John in the book of Revelation, and most of his sermon is actually hearkening back to the major and minor prophets that it's going to take us quite a while because there are so many connections. It's kind of like uh, when, you, when you're uh, trying to figure out the tangle of cords you know, in your office or something, they go in so many different directions to untangle them. You have to take a while and trace each one, and that's kind of how we're going to have to go through Matthew 24. Verse 15 introduces, as we looked at this morning, the man of sin, the Antichrist. He is called, in this verse, the abomination of desolation. Now, as the end of the world gets closer, the world gets darker. And I want you to think about that as I just trace one facet, and that is how quickly this man can rise to power. And I'm going to use the example of the biography of one of the clearest examples of an Antichrist, and that is Adolf Hitler. Hitler rose from being imprisoned as a political dissident in 1923 to becoming the premier of Germany in 33 to becoming in 39 the conqueror of the world in just six years, as I mentioned. I mean, it's very rapid how quickly things can happen. At the end of the world, hell will open and the pit will vomit out demon hordes. It says in 1 Timothy 4.1 that in the end of days... People will give heed to demons. Now, when I said the world's getting darker, look at the tone of much of the television programming and the movie content. There is an increasing tone of the occult. Now, they don't call it satanic. Uh, They call it forces and powers and visitors from outer space and all kinds of stuff but all of the powers in this universe apart from the true and living god are from the devil and i want you to think about that when you look at the direction our world is going more and more of this stuff from the pit at the helm of the world at the end the visible leader will be the long promised man of sin The Antichrist, the man I told you with 33 Old Testament titles and 13 or 14, depending on how you count, New Testament titles. But behind him, the real power is the god of this world, the dragon, Lucifer, the lying serpent from Eden. The Bible clearly teaches that we can expect an invasion from the pit in the last days. And that's why, if you slip down to verse 24, the the false prophets and false Christs are going to be, notice what it says, having great signs and wonders. Now, I want you now to slip back with me to Revelation 12, because I want to show you the actual sight of this event. Because John, a first century man, saw through first century eyes. The book of Revelation is postured in this way. A first century individual, John, is looking and writing down as fast as he can his actual seeing the events at the end. He was actually there as they were happening. That's what the Bible gives you. The Bible doesn't give you predictions of how it might come out. It's an actual first person witnessing of it happening. It's not like it's going to happen a little bit different. He actually saw the future as it happened. That's what the Bible is. Sometimes we think uh, so much in, in Tim LaHaye, left behind terms, that this is how it might be. We, we don't realize John actually saw it happening. So through first century eyes, chapter 12, starting in verse 17, this is what life on earth will be like during the dark, confusing times that are coming, when the most believable signs and wonders ever witnessed will be occurring and the whole world will be following them. Starting in verse 17, And the dragon, 
And, of course, introduced in verse 9 of chapter 12. I'm not going to go through this. It's the complete tying together. Remember, John ties the whole Bible together, 404 verses, over 800 allusions to all the other books of the Bible. Amazing. And he just networks the whole Bible together. That's why Revelation is so important. And he, in verse 9, says that the dragon is the serpent, is the devil, is Satan. So, whoo, all those pieces come together. So... From the Garden of Eden to the book of Job to the one trying to make Jesus, you know, uh, throw himself down. It's all the same person. And that same person is verse 17, the dragon. The second most powerful being in the universe after God. Remember that. The greatest created being ever made in power is Satan. And so this dragon was enraged with the woman that's israel and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring that's because the nation of israel is protected by god during the tribulation that's between verse 13 and 16 and he meant to make war with the rest of her offspring that's that's the believers that are on the earth there are going to be saints on the earth during the tribulation we saw that this morning who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these are what we would call tribulation saints. Now watch, here's the Antichrist rising. The devil is enraged and he's attacking believers. Now chapter 13, verse 1, John says, I'm standing on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, that's out of the nations, having seven heads and ten horns, and on the horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And the beast I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And he goes through this whole description of him. At the end of verse 5, he's given authority to continue for 42 months. We saw that this morning in in Daniel. Three and a half years of intense power. Uh, Verse 6, he's blaspheming. Verse 7, this is the verse I wanted to get to. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints. Now look what it says. And to overcome them. It's the darkest hour on this planet. The Jews are being driven into this hideaway near destruction. The saints are hunted down one at a time. And they don't, they don't escape it. He overcomes them. That's, and if you know from chapter 7, they're martyred. They're wearing white robes and they're in heaven. He's basically hunting down and killing all the saints. And, look at the end of verse 7, authority was given to him, to this beast, this antichrist, this incarnation of Satan, this man with all these titles in the Bible, to him was given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So, the greatest universal power ever granted to any human being, this beast antichrist has over every uh, different tribe, tongue, and nation. Verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Wow, what, what a, a dreadful time. Satan is going to send to earth the very expression of all of mankind's desires in the person of the Antichrist, and in a very short time, almost all the earth will follow him. Now we know that the tribulation saints won't. We know that the Jews, uh, the, the remnant won't. But seemingly everyone else does. Amazing. And that's what makes it so hard. God came in human flesh, and no one was more true and honest and loving than Jesus Christ, and only a few followed him. And the incarnation of the devil comes, and everyone follows him and worships him, which shows you the fallenness of humanity. Always making the wrong choices. Always wanting the wrong thing. And there's a day coming when most of the people on the earth will want to follow this ultimate Superman that I described this morning. Someone who will be as winsome as Reagan, as fearless as Alexander the Great, as mesmerizing as Hitler, as beloved as George Washington, as great a leader as Moses, as unstoppable a warrior as Genghis Khan, and as spiritually charismatic as King David himself. And they'll all be led in worship of him. Well, we have had several warm-up acts by Satan for this future man coming. You know, Satan has groomed many. Some of the Roman emperors kind of had this 
emperor worship idea and they got the whole Roman Empire to worship him. Others have, have, have gotten at least great portions of the earth to worship them, but no one has had universal worship till this guy, this Antichrist, this man of sin. But most clearly we can see the way Satan works in the life and accomplishments of a recent person, someone who only died 60 years ago. In fact, a lot of people don't think he died. Two whole books have been written that Hitler is still alive. I'm talking about not wacko books, I mean serious books. Uh, they think that he really did escape. And that the, you know, I mean, it just came out this week that the Germans actually had weapon plans for nuclear bombs. They just couldn't put them together fast enough. Can you imagine if Hitler would have gotten the atom bomb? Uh, amazing to think what would the difference in the war would have been. But Adolf Hitler showed the world what one man can do, completely harnessed and indwelt by Satan. And I just want to briefly talk to you about Hitler, because what I'm sharing with you is available in any library, and if you look at it with spiritual eyes, you see how quickly God's end-time scenario can come true with a normal human being who utterly gives himself to the devil. Hitler was an antichrist. People who had personal contact with Hitler often spoke of his strange hypnotic power. I, I'm not talking about believers. I'm talking about people that worked with him said that he had an ability to look at people and mesmerize, hypnotize them just in a meeting. They would come in and they'd go out in the me of the meeting just doing whatever he wanted. He had this mental control. In fact, a historic figure, in 1943, 100,000 young people in brown shirts filled the Olympic Stadium in Munich, Germany. It was the largest stadium in the world at that time, and they formed with their bodies words on the, the playing field of the Olympic Stadium. Those 100,000 brown shirts wrote these words in German, Hitler, we are yours. They, they all stood, you know, kind of in formations of letters. And he got that stadium. You've probably seen the film clips of it. He got them chanting. He spoke to them so powerfully that he got them all chanting, and they formed those words on the stadium field. What did he tell them? Well, at the monument to Hitler's evil, which is called Auschwitz, that's the death camp, Hitler's words of his vision for a generation of young people who had no conscience are still hanging on the wall. If you ever go to Auschwitz, it's in Poland, and it's a very sobering place to visit. And these are the words that are on a sign. It's a grim reminder to the visitor of the hell unleashed when Hitler's goal was realized. Remember, his goal was to raise a generation of young people who had no conscience. And this is what he told them in that stadium in 1943. I freed Germany from the stupid and degrading fallacies of conscience and morality. I will train young people before whom the world will tremble. I want young people capable of violence, imperious, relentless, and cruel. Did he accomplish his goal? Yes, he did. Looking back at the atrocities of World War II, there is no human explanation for them. They are demonic because they are like the one who came to kill and steal and destroy, as Jesus said in John chapter 10. On display, right by the sign, by the way, in Auschwitz, for all to see are thousands of pounds of women's hair, retrieved and marketed as a commodity by the Nazi exterminators. You can just see it. If you go through the rooms, they just have mounds of human hair and spectacles and dental stuff. They just... They just gassed those people and extracted their teeth and threw their hair in one place and their spectacles in others and actually made some of them, they used their skin and made it into leather and marketed goods from human skin tanned into leather. Well, how did Satan find and use Hitler? Okay, that's in the Bible. Why don't you turn back to Isaiah 14 with me. Uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are the, the description of of where Satan came from, and it will always explain who Satan is looking for when he wants to use someone, because he wants someone just like him. And so how did uh, Satan find and use Hitler? Well, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12, explains, because 
Satan was the original Antichrist. Hitler was an Antichrist. He wasn't the Antichrist. He wanted to be. Uh, the demons wanted to be. In fact, Satan might have thought he was going to be, but it didn't work out because it wasn't God's time. Remember, Satan does not know God's timing. God has a plan. And God has an exact moment in history that the Antichrist, with a capital A, will be unveiled. Satan never knows who it is, so he always has someone in the wings. And he's always grooming and possessing and pushing forward someone. And the Lord lets him go so far, cuts him short. Hitler was the man of the hour. How did the devil get him? Well, Lucifer... Satan was the original Antichrist. In Isaiah 14, what we see starting in verse 12 is that he wanted the power of God and he wanted the worship of God for himself. And he says in the the classic description, verse 12, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are fallen from heaven. Verse 13, you have said in your heart, and this is Isaiah, under the inspiration of God, describing an event, the fall of Satan. Satan says these following statements, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You notice it doesn't say above God. It's above the stars of God. Because even Satan knew nothing can be greater than God. I will sit on the Mount of Congregation. You notice it says, I will also sit. Who else is going to sit there? God. Satan couldn't conceive of anything greater than God. He just wanted to be equal. So that's one of the evidences of inspiration. If a pagan was writing this, they would have said Satan wanted to be greater than God. That would be how the human mind would think. Satan knew that no one could be greater than God. He was a created being. He knows that. He just wanted to be like, equal, on the same shelf with God. Keep reading. I will, verse 14, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be not greater, not in place of, not overwhelmed, but I will be like the Most High. So that's what Satan wanted. If you also read Ezekiel 28, he was the anointed cherub. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. His response to his endowment was one of pride and rebellion. Rebellion is when you don't want the constrictions or the restrictions or the the rules that God placed around him. His job was not to take God's glory, but to give God glory. His job was not to be like God. His job was to bow and worship and be the anointed, full of wisdom leader. Basically, we believe from the scriptures, from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, Satan was the worship leader of heaven. In fact, very clearly, he was involved with music. It talks about the timbrels and and all these. He was involved with music. He was the worship leader of heaven. And it went to him, and he decided he wanted to be like God. Well, God rejected this power play and promised his doom in hell. Notice what it says in verse 15. You'll be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And, of course, we know from Revelation 20 that he's going to be in the lake of fire. But until... Revelation 20, until the end, Satan is on the prowl. He is seeking likely candidates that he can lead into his way. What's his way? Satan's way is rebellion. And I want you to think about that. Because rebellion in our lives gives Satan an open invitation to establish a beachhead to start invading a life. Rebellion opens the door to the devil. Satan is drawn toward rebellion. He likes rebels. And he, through his infernal power, is looking for rebels. Turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. It's a very, very sobering verse. Paul goes through a whole list of sins that believers uh, can do in their disobedience to God. And I want you to think about this because a prime example of the rebellion occult connection is Adolf Hitler. Hitler's early life could be characterized by one word, failure. He made a living, a meager living, on his dead mother's limited savings and also his father's orphan account. Because his father had died and he was an orphan, he got a pension from the state and his mother had savings and she had died. And so Hitler was living on those two things. And he thought he was an artist... Hitler thought he was an artist, kind of like Nero thought that he was a musician. But when he applied at Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts, he was rejected. So he applied next at the School of Architecture, and he was refused. 
And so one of his biographers, an unsaved man, uh, wrote this. Unable to make friends, Hitler became day by day more solitary and embittered. So, so his hard life circumstance made him bitter, and that bitterness led him into complete rebellion against society. That's why he was imprisoned as a dissident back in the 20s. To make a long story short, Hitler was angry at God and at society because of his plight. Because of his anger, he rebelled against God and society. He didn't just deny God. He got angry at the establishment around him. In his quest to change his plight, he turned to the occult. I don't know about here because I haven't checked, but when we were back east... I went to the Barnes & Noble, which had a Starbucks coffee shop in it, and I was drinking my coffee, and I, I noticed the place was swarming with kids. So I wanted to see what they would be interested in Barnes & Nobles. And I walked up there, and in Massachusetts, there was a wall, uh, the entire length of one part of Barnes & Nobles, and the title of it was Occult and Paranormal. And it was this whole Harry Potter thing, but it was the entire wall that had to do with the occult and witchcraft and paranormal power and all that stuff. And that was where the kids were swarming. And they were all sitting around reading those books. And, and it, things haven't changed because that's exactly where Hitler went. And he went into the occult and he began spending his free time in the Hofburg Library in Vienna, reading books on the history of the occult in Eastern religions. And the occult seemed to offer him the power he was looking for. Now, while he was hanging out in the library doing this, he started listening to the lectures that were given at this Hofburg library, because I don't know if you realize this, but in and still in that library is this spear that supposedly was the spear that pierced the side of Jesus Christ, and it's a relic. And every emperor of Europe for a thousand years had that spear when they conquered and came to power. And so it was on display, and the guide would say that that spear, it's called the spear of destiny, was shrouded with mystery, and whoever unlocked the secrets of that spear would rule the world. And Hitler stood there, and as he read his books, he heard the tour guide giving this, this lecture all the time, because they would always stop in the library and point up to their big exhibit, and he began thinking about that and started studying the occultic connection of that spear in that library. And by the way, Dr. Walter Stein, the librarian that gave the tour, later on in the Nuremberg trials, remember when they were going through all the Nazi uh, punishment that was meted out for all the, the deadly things they did, he testified, and we have on record his testimony of Hitler's beginnings. This is what Dr. Stein said. He said, Adolf Hitler, he was the librarian, and he noticed this young student who would stand looking up at that spear. And this is what Stein said. Adolf Hitler would stand like a man in a trance, a man over whom some dreadful magic spell had been cast. He would sway on his feet as though caught up in some totally inexplicable euphoria. His whole facial appearance and stance were transformed as if a mighty spirit inhabited his soul creating within and around him a kind of evil transformation of its own nature and power. That's what Stein said happened to him. So what Hitler did is he left Hofburg Library and went back and met, as you know from history, Eckhart and all the other founders of the Nazi party, who all were initiates into satanic rituals, and they said that in a seance he was the man Satan had picked to be the Messiah. And he believed it. By the way, do you know what the first thing Hitler did after he conquered uh, Austria, at the Anschluss. Do you know the first thing he did in Austria? He went to the Vienna Library and took that spear and took it back to his headquarters and had it throughout all of World War II and thought he was going to conquer the world with it. Well, Hitler opened his life to Satan. Look what it says in Ephesians 4.27. It says, Do not give place to the devil. Rebellion, the occult, all of that paranormal power opens up our lives to the influence of the devil. And if you're not born again, to the indwelling and the total control of the evil one. And that's what Hitler did. Hitler opened his life because everywhere and always demons have lurked in the dark for the moment when a person will become weak. 
When a person will drop the guards in their life and open their life to their influence, and after the first voluntary downward step, a person is compelled with the second and third and rapidly increasing speed to give in to the power of demons, which we see with those who get enmeshed in this. And once they're exposed, they're unable to resist the power. Well, basically, the demons that controlled the demented soul of Adolf Hitler lured him to prepare Germany over those six years of industrialization to get ready for war. And then starting in 1939, those demons lured Hitler to take his nation into World War II. And then those demons abandoned him and his country to their fate. And Hitler and his fellow conspirators almost succeeded. And there's just a few things they did wrong or they would have won. But what's amazing is that the whole Nazi era was just a dress rehearsal because Hitler ended up killing himself. Remember he committed suicide and had him dump gas on him and burn his body because he didn't want you know, them to be able to do anything to him. But it was only a dress rehearsal, those six years, for what the final dark era of earth will be like. One man, totally encompassed by the devil, can do so much. Hitler found that Satan lived up to the titles given to him. Revelation 9.11 says that they have a king over them, the king which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon in the Hebrew tongue, and in the Greek tongue, Apollyon, which means destroyer. Hitler was used by Satan to destroy six million plus of God's chosen people, multiplied millions more, as many as 50 million died in World War II. And then, in mockery to Hitler himself, Satan motivated him to commit suicide. Hitler destroyed six six plus million Jews, the war, 50 plus million people, and then Hitler destroyed himself. Hitler, like Satan, was a destroyer. Well, always remember that rebellion, in any form, attracts Satan. In fact, I want you to turn back with me to 1 Samuel 15. I say this all the time, but I think you need it marked in your Bible. In verse 23, rebellion, in any form, rebellion against authority, rebellion against God, rebellion against your parents, rebellion is dangerous with a capital D. Why? Because rebellion invites Satan into your life because he's the original rebel. It says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, So Samuel said, Has the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings, or verse 22, in burnt offerings as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. That was a stunning statement. He says, God would rather have your obedience than you hauling in all these sheep and, and, and offering them in the temple or in the tabernacle. Now, look at verse 23. For rebellion, and then it's in italics because it's supplied, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know what it is in Hebrew? Rebellion, and it's almost like dash dash or an M dash, is witchcraft occultic, satanic. Satan is the original rebel. He rebelled against God, and he loves rebellion, and he's drawn to rebellion. And rebellion is just like witchcraft. It's just like invoking and inviting. You know what witchcraft is? It's inviting the power in this universe, apart from God, into your life. That's what witchcraft is. In all of its forms, it's inviting the other source of power, which is not of God, in. And do you know what this says? It says just as witchcraft and seances and all that occultic stuff invites Satan in, rebellion invites him in too. So always remember how dangerous rebellion is. And remember, it's an open invitation to Satan to destroy your life. Christ, on the other hand, offers us an abundant life. John 10 says, I'm come that you might have an abundant, overflowing life. The devil's come to kill and steal and destroy. His calling card is rebellion. And rebellion is like witchcraft. And witchcraft is inviting his power in. So rebellion invites it in. But Jesus says, submission to me is how you enter into the abundant life. Now, seeing how quickly Hitler did all that, what does it have to do with Matthew 24? 
Well, Matthew 24, and I want to end there, okay? So go back to Matthew 24 before we go, because I want you to see where I'm going with this. Matthew 24 and verse 24 tells us that the characteristic of the end when this Antichrist is rising is that there is all this false teaching. These false prophets and teachers that we saw two weeks ago when we looked at what Peter said about them, there are these false teachers. Why does Satan want so badly to bring false teaching in? Because only the true Christ can save your soul and protect you from the devil. The false Christ cannot protect you. The false teaching cannot guard you. Doctrine is so important because if you don't believe right, you can't be protected from the power of Satan. And that's why it's so important to understand, and I just want to read this off to you again, what it is that God signs on our life. And so if if you didn't get it this morning because I went so fast, I want to read to you again the list before we go. We have six minutes for me to read to you. Because the work of salvation, true doctrine, causes these divine changes to occur in our life. I call it the signature of God. When you call upon Christ in repentant faith, God saves you. Salvation is the greatest work of God in the universe. And I like this. Someone that was uh, saved in in, uh, the prison invasion ministry in the penitentiary was writing in and wrote to Moody Bible Institute. And this is what they wrote. After they got saved in the in the prisons they were enrolled in a movie bible institute bible study course and and they wrote in in their correspondence course and in answers to one of the questions for them to express where they stood in relation to christ this is what they wrote i am a new man in an old body i thought that's so true that's what happens when we got saved we're a new man in an old body but in a most powerful way that's just the beginning of what god does If you go further, that that saved prisoner need to realize one day he'll be a new man in a new body. And that's what salvation is. It's not just a new man in an old body, but it's a new man in an old body that's going to sooner or later be a new man in a new body. And that's what salvation is. It's not just to get us to be a new man in an old body and stay that way. It's to change us to fit us for heaven. And that's why I like these seven steps. And you just write them down and we'll pick up here. Write down regeneration. Regeneration, and you can write Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, and I'll read it to you. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away your heart of stone out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. What is regeneration? It's when God changes my heart and gives me a new heart. He doesn't... doesn't fix my old heart i get a brand new heart that is regeneration i am born again i am a totally new from the beginning from the inside out new so regeneration is when god changes my heart number two conversion is when god changes my life and i you can write down this verse matthew 18 3 and jesus said assuredly i say to you unless you are converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Conversion is when God changes my life. In fact, conversion, the Lord said to Peter, when you are converted, you'll tell your brethren this or that. When your life changes. So it's, it's an amazing thing. God converts us. It's just like you, you convert uh, something, the, the current, it has to go through that converter and it changes uh, when you travel. You have to convert the current. And, and God converts us. He changes our life. Thirdly, God also, in Matthew 3 and verse 8, talks about repentance. He says, therefore, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You see, our operating system, when God saved us, when he changes our life, he changes us in our whole direction of our life. And he he makes us, remember, your body goes wherever your mind goes. Be careful what you think about. That's why rebellion is so dangerous. Whatever you think, you'll do, apart from intervention of strong forces. And usually someone that does something bad, the Puritans used to say this, they say the wagons follow the ruts. The ruts, spiritually, are what we think about all the time. And if God does not get our mind to turn toward him, then our body will never follow. And that's why 
We have to have this change of our mind when God totally transforms us. The fourth one, adoption, when God changes my family, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage, but you received the spirit of adoption. Wherever you cry, Abba, Father, our whole family is changed. God changes my family orientation and adoption. Sanctification is Hebrews 10, 14 through 16. That's when God changes my behavior. My behavior is changed incrementally from glory to glory. My behavior is changed little by little as God gets more and more of me. I have all of God. God does not have all of me. Sanctification is that lifelong process. It says this in Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Lifelong process. God changing my behavior. Justification is when God changes my state. That's Romans 5, 1. Uh, We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, That's when God says, your sins and iniquities, I remember no more. We don't forget them. And and that tension is, to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. Uh, We don't forget them. That's why Paul would say in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, and would follow up in Romans 8 and say, but I'm never going to be condemned for it because what God's forgiven, he's forgotten. But there is that lifelong awareness. God does not erase our mind. He just erases our record. And so we remember, and we have to deal with that, and that's part of sanctification in Hebrews 9.14 and 10.22, talking about having our minds cleansed. The last step, regeneration, conversion, repentance, adoption, sanctification, justification. The last step is glorification, and that's John 17.24. And I love this. Father, I desire that they also who you gave me may be with me. Glorification is when God changes my location. Someday, I'll be where Jesus is. Someday, I'll be a new man in a new body. But as long as I'm on earth, I'm a new man in an old body. And I have to allow God to keep changing my heart, changing my life, changing my mind, reminding me what family I'm in, changing my behavior based on the fact he changed my state. He's changed me, and I am never going to be condemned. And someday, I will get to stand before him, a new man in a new body. That's the good news that Satan doesn't want people to know. That's why false doctrine, as we'll see next week, is so prevalent. Because if you don't know the truth... You can never be set free. And people who never hear and understand and embrace the truth are never set free. And they're able to be deceived by demons and someday by the incarnation of Satan himself, the Antichrist, who will be accepted by almost the whole world. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege we have to know the truth to love the truth, to live the truth, but also to share the truth. And I pray that we would know your word and allow you to change us from the inside out and then open our mouths to tell others what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I pray that we would be speaking the truth, living the truth, and expectantly looking for you to let us new people someday be in your presence in a new body. But until then, you want us to serve you faithfully and resist this evil world around us and rescue many that are perishing. Thank you for the privilege of looking into your word. Thank you for reminding us that we are kept by your spirit. But help us not to open the door by rebellion to give a place to the devil. And I pray that no one would be walking that dangerous line of rebellion against authority, against you, against parents, against government, even in little ways, because that invites your nefarious influence upon our lives. And we'll thank you that you give us the power to flee sin in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.